Mary, congratulations. We're looking forward to your lecture. Thanks. So I, I guess I'll just say a couple of words before I start the official talk, which is, um, I guess, really to thank all the people that um, I've worked with, and I'm going to do some acknowledgements at the end. But you heard already those names, Roger Newman, Hugh Isaacs, George Thompson, Dave Williams, lots of people who have already won this award, which makes me feel even more like an imposter because I know how brilliant those people were, but I also know how lucky I was to learn from them. Um, it's also really special to be receiving this award in Manchester, where I started out on my corrosion journey. Um, still don't quite remember how that happened from doing a degree in maths and physics to coming and doing corrosion science here, but it was, um, I guess, one of the most fortuitous accidents in my life that I picked up a leaflet for an MSc in corrosion and came in and, and from there on learned really to love electrochemistry. And of course, a lot of what I know about electrochemistry I learned from Bob as, a, as my lecturer. So I, think, I do think it's now time to move on from Evans as the father of corrosion, because for me, he was the grandfather. And <laughs> we're probably at the great grandfather stage now. Um, but I have got some, a talk, which I think we should um, we'll start. I can start. Okay. So, quite often when I give a talk, people will say to me, well, that's very nice, but what's that got to do with corrosion? So hopefully at the end, you will know what this has to do with corrosion. Um, and my work really, it's, you'll see I sit in the London Centre for Nanotechnology at Imperial College. We're interested in the nanoscale behaviour of bulk materials. So very small features in bulk materials that ultimately determine the macroscale behaviour, but then also the behaviour of nanoscale objects themselves, how nanoparticles behave in system. And really, we try in my group to explore not just understanding the fundamental mechanisms of corrosion and as they apply to corrosion protection and corrosion prediction, but where some of those insights and mechanisms that you find in corrosion science might be applied and useful in other scenarios. Okay, so just in case you haven't looked up the definition of corrosion lately, here's the, the International Union of Corrosion Applied Chemists definition of corrosion. An irreversible interfacial reaction of a material, that can be metal, ceramic, or polymer, with its environment which results in consumption of the material or in dissolution into the material of a component of the environment. Often, but not necessarily, corrosion results in effects detrimental to the use of the material considered. So we are often very preconditioned to ignore that, but not necessarily. Um, and I'm going to show you from some of our work where that not necessarily is actually a really important and corrosion phenomenon can be ultimately useful to us. Okay, so this is my group. And sorry, Tony, other Ryan groups are available. <laughs> <laughs> this is what we do in my group at Imperial College. Um, and, oh, no, I didn't mean to do that. There's a laser pointer. Okay, so, so we're really focused on material environment interactions. And I have a little nano there because that's the length scale we're interested in. I need to be closer. I just need to turn it this way a little bit. Okay. All right. Is that better? Um, traditional corrosion mechanisms, um, and really my group were looking at passivity, pitting, and de-alloying. I'm not going to talk about pitting today, much to the annoyance of somebody who already asked me at lunchtime if I was going to show all those pitting work that I did originally, but no, we're not going to talk about pitting. Um, we work on biological interfaces, and that encompasses things like sensors and toxicity, we do a lot of work on nanomaterials for energy. Um, and as you, you know, Bill alluded to, the energy transition has got a lot of materials that we haven't really understood before. So interfaces in batteries and hydrogen fuel cells have got an awful lot of really fundamental corrosion problems that we still don't understand. I was at a, a, an electrochemistry meeting. It must have been two years ago, maybe three years ago. We've all lost a year. Um, and there's about 100 people in the room. And obviously, in any general electrochemistry meeting now, 80% of those people are battery people. And, um, and I said to them, how many of you people are doing corrosion? And one person put their hand up, and that was my student. And um, I said, okay, how many of you people are interested in the degradation of materials in an electrochemical interface that results in damage or decay of your system? 80% of them put their hands up. Like, You're all corrosion people. Right, so there is this challenge of terminology, I think, across disciplines, and I think there is, as Bill said, real opportunity in, in this, this space. Um, we also, as an aside, and I'm not going to talk about this today, um, do quite a lot of work on conservation. Um, 
and we we work um, quite a lot with some of the, the major museums. Really, not as I'm not a corrosion, I'm not a conservation or a heritage scientist, but a lot of the things that we know help museum scientists and in cultural heritage in in defending, I guess, their their collections. So I'm going to start off just by talking about passivity, um, mostly because that's the work I started here when I was doing my PhD, um, and it's quite nice to revisit every so often and quite depressing to realise we still have a lot to learn um, about passivity. Um, and just to kind of highlight really what we do down here at this length scale, but to really understand corrosion, you've got to be able to work across multiple length scales. From the macro scale or what you might call bulk, um, you can fill in your own favourite topics in these fields, by the way. This, isn't, this is a, a merry list, not an exhaustive list. Um, down to the micro scale where you might have sulphide inclusions, down to the nano scale, which is where most of my work is focused on, and I'm going to talk today about some research in each of these areas, passive films, de-alloying deposits, and, and nanoparticles, down to the atomic scale, where we're really interested in understanding phase and also molecular absorption. Okay, so I'm going to probably show you a lot of different techniques that are in-situ techniques. I won't have time to explain them all, um, but feel free to ask me about them later. Um, and it's important when you're trying to measure something that you really think about what you're measuring. And this is a particularly true when you go to high resolution techniques, because you can use a technique that's looking at some bulk system where you need a nanoscale resolution of that system. You might have an assembly of nano objects or you might have an individual nanoparticle that you're trying to study. And there are two ways to try and do that. You can get averaged information over a large scale and assume that you can deconvolute that out. And that is really good for statistics and signal to noise. But, but you might miss some of these critical events that only happen one in a million times. And you don't ever see that when it's averaged out. But as you go down to try and look at some of these really small objects at the right length scale, especially in situ, that the experimental challenges become much harder. And so you have to really think about the stability and the sensitivity. And, and again, statistics, you look at one nanoparticle, how representative is that of the whole system? So this kind of idea flows through all the work that we do, that we have to really be critical about how you are measuring your system. OK, so passivity. So back in 1991, when I started here at UMIS, um, the project of my work, and it's not dissimilar from Dominic's topic, actually, was can we use STM and AFM to look at passive systems? We didn't even know if we could, right? and what can you do with that system? And, of course, passivity, I don't need to tell people here what the definition of passivity here is. It's a kinetic restriction of a surface reaction despite this high thermodynamic tendency to react caused by the formation of a surface oxide film. And passivity, like most things in electrochemistry, were first really recorded and commented on by Faraday. And this is known as Faraday's electrochemical paradox um, and in contrast to what Bill was saying earlier, what Faraday noticed was, as you go to a high concentration solution of nitric acid, your iron stopped corroding. Right? Um, and that's got to do with a huge oxidation potential, which allowed it to passivate that you got with the concentration of the acid. And Faraday noticed this, despite being 70 years before the pH scale was invented and before we really understood what surfaces were and surface oxidation was. Um, Passive films remained controversial, partly because they're really hard to study. Right? You've got these, oh, no, these oxide films are typically very thin. Five nanometers would be a thick passive oxide. Because they're so thin and they're at this electrochemical interface, the electric field that drops across that film is enormous, right? somewhere on the order of 10 to 6 volts per centimeter. So these conditions are very non-equilibrium. You're in an aqueous environment with a high field. So if you form your passive film and then you take it out and you put it in an exit juice scenario, potentially with a high vacuum, you change potentially everything you're trying to measure. When I started my PhD, there was a huge debate in the literature about whether passive films were amorph amorphous or crystalline, um, partly because they're very hard to study and there was lots of conflicting data and people were comparing different types of data. People were doing a lot of spectroscopy and from spectroscopic measurements like XPS, trying to extract what is the crystalline phase of that material. And, it, and so for pure iron, there were two camps. There was one camp that said it's a bilayer film and it's something like Fe203. And there was a camp that said it's completely amorphous. 
This debate was further exacerbated when you started to look at stainless steel and really from the work of Jerry Kruger, who did a lot of work on stainless steels and really developed this idea that amorphous films were somehow better and that chromium made the films amorphous and that amorphous structure gave you resistance. Okay, so a word of caution for PhD students here. If you go back and read Jerry Kruger's first ever paper where he analyzed passive films, he had absolutely the right answer. And then with time, as the idea of this mechanism kind of overtook the community, he forgot his own data. And he was a really strong advocate that passive films are, on chromium alloys are amorphous, even though his early data showed that not to be true. Right, so it's an interesting exercise to, to work backwards right, through his papers. So what we did was say, well, can we use STM to kind of answer this riddle? And it turns out if you've got the right technique, then absolutely you can. Look, here's the passive film on iron. Um, it's beautifully crystalline. Nobody's going to argue with that. Um, but it, more interestingly than that, actually, well, maybe not more interestingly, equally interesting to that was at this length scale, so you can clearly see the atomic resolution, and this is consistent with a spinel oxide 111 projection. As you zoom out from that, you start to see that it's made up of these little crystallites. So this crystalline oxide is actually nanocrystalline. And then on top of this, you can see um, for our material, these are the grain boundaries in the bulk metal. So we use STM to show this, but that doesn't really give you a full structural determination. It tells you, yes, it's crystalline, but it doesn't tell you what it is. So then we did some grazing instance X-ray diffraction in situ. And this is just a snapshot of those data. This is the 002 peak of pure on a single crystal of pure iron. And this is the passive film growing over time. Um, and so the peak width here is, very, this is a very broad peak. That's because it's nanocrystalline. But from doing this data and mapping exhaustively the whole of reciprocal space, you're able to actually pull out a full crystallographic description of what that passive film is and how that changes with things like potential and pH. So, so now we have something that we can model. Right? We have a, a structure just for pure iron. Right? We do not have these data at this level for any other material system. Right? You do not have a full crystalline characterization of any other passive oxide. And yet, apparently, we can model to thousands of years in the future how passive films are going to behave in the nuclear repository. Anyway, so we took these data, and I'm an experimentalist, so we worked, we worked quite closely with Sean Hendy's group to try and understand how, once we knew what the, the atomic structure was, how to translate that into a model. Um, so this is the Battaglia and Newman model. This is the other Newman, John Newman um, from Berkeley. And this looks very much like a Wagner-type transport model. We've got ionic transport, um, and the system current is going to depend on diffusion potential and concentration gradient. So we know what our atomic structure is, so we know how um, species will transport through that film, and we can do a, a DFT calculation to work out the diffusion rate. And when you do that, based on the real data, you get a diffusion rate through the film of 10 to the minus 18 centimeter squared per second. But if you fit the experimental data to extract that diffusion rate, it's a two orders of magnitude faster. Right? So what that is telling us, actually, is that in the growth of these passive films, at least on iron and ferrous alloys, the current density in the passive state, the growth rate, is massively dependent on the grain boundaries. Right? Grain boundary transport, which you can then, this is a little bit more hand wavy but you can extract from the images the percentage of areas that contribute to those grain boundaries. And when you then fit diffusion through the grain boundaries, you come up with something much, much closer to that experimental um, approach. So this approach gives us an accurate prediction of growth rates, potentially is useful for in investigation of the breakdown mechanisms, but it really tells us well, one, use the right technique if you want to measure something. And two, please don't ignore the nanoscale in corrosion systems. So they'll just briefly talk about what chromium then does and why chromium, the iron chromium system in particular, gave rise to so much controversy. Um, so we first of all did STM over in the mill. 
And um, we showed that up to about 21% chromium, you started with something that was disordered, but it crystallized quite quickly over the period of hours in situ under an electric field. And it crystallized into something that's spinel-like. So it's behaving a lot like iron. When you got to about 21% chromium, though, the grain size is now only about two and a half nanometers. So the grain size as you add chromium is shrinking down. And so experimentally, this now becomes much more difficult to differentiate from something that looks amorphous. And by the time you've got to about 23% chromium, um, the material is very close to amorphous. But we saw this, we see this short range ordering both in STM and in diffraction. Of course, if you went to pure chromium, and we've also shown this, it's crystalline again. Right? So this disorder is to do with the competition between iron and chromium and how they form these networks in the oxide state. So the message, and these are some, some very recent um, X-ray diffraction, in situ X-ray diffraction data, which aren't showing up very clearly here, but here are the Bragg peaks for the single crystal metal, and here are peaks for the oxide film. So it's on... This is, I think, 16% chromium, but up to 21% chromium, we see these very clear diffraction peaks in situ on these oxide films and on, on this stainless steel. It's about two nanometers thick oxide under an electric field. So here's the takeaway message that's really important. The passive film is not CR203. So if that's what you're modeling, you're wrong, right? At least under air formed or high potential conditions, it's much more likely to be a spinel than a corundum. And it's absolutely not amorphous. Okay. I guess the other message for just for students here, I'm going to show, go back. We started this work quite early on. And 10 years later, we were still trying to unravel and untangle a lot of what the data meant and modeling of those data. So don't expect to get an answer to a hard question really quickly. Okay. So back to some more um, slightly more recent work. And I want to just, I guess, draw some analogies between the work that we do in the energy space and in the nanospace to, to some of the phenomenon that we're used to thinking about as corrosion phenomena. Um, and we'll just walk through some examples of these different types of systems. Okay, so when we think about scaling, we normally think about things like the beautiful CO2 corrosion that, that Bill showed us early, earlier, or, or iron sulfide formation in, in sour gas. And these are just some data from our lab on um, forming iron sulfide in a really controlled con way and then looking at the type of structures that you form. And what you see when you do that, you see these extraordinarily complex nanoscale structures that are formed when iron dissolves and it meets some sulfur in the environment. And of course, what you get depends massively on all the different parameters that are existing in the system, the temperature, the flow, the concentrations. Um, but it's not a simple layer of iron sulfide. And, and actually, when you go in a little bit more closely, you can see right at the iron, iron sulfide interface, it's beautifully coherent. And then we form these nanoscale features that are perfectly crystalline iron sulfide. What we're seeing here is, is I guess, a combination of surface reaction and local precipitation. And this local precipitation really that we're interested in is, is precipitation of a system driven by an electrochemically generated concentration profile. So we normally think of supersaturation in chemical systems. You know, everyone does a sugar experiment and let it cool down and it precipitates out. Here what we're finding is in electrochemical systems, it changes locally the concentration profile and locally will supersaturate. And depending on those local supersaturation conditions will give you different types of structures. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about zinc oxide because this is a very similar phenomenon um, and a lot of the work that we learned from doing corrosion, we, we apply to thinking about what's happening with zinc oxide deposition. Um, and if you've got some zinc ions in a solution near a cathode, and at your cathode, you are causing an increase in the pH or an alkalization locally of that film, you're very likely to hop over into this region of the phase stability curve where we've got zinc oxide solid. All right. And so this is a process that's driven by oxygen reduction that leads to precipitation directly of crystalline zinc oxide on the surface. And it turns out this process can give you all kinds of amazingly funky 
materials from one dimensional rods to two dimensional, almost two dimensional sh sheets to these beautiful tubes to kind of bulk platelets. And you can use templates to make ordered crystalline structures as well, if you like. Of course, defining when you get what of those things is quite hard, right? You don't want to just guess what you're going to get. And the parameter space is a range, is, it includes this range of parameters, pH, temperature, the concentration of zinc 2 plus the concentration of chloride has a huge effect, and I'll explain why in a minute, and the electrochemical potential, which is driving that oxygen reduction. So we were interested in trying to really understand what was the role of each of these parameters and what was this process? How did this process work? And could you find, I guess, a design map that would help you pick a set of conditions to, to be able to make the material that you wanted? So we started off by just saying, how can we really, really sensibly measure the deposition rate? And we decided to use um, X-ray absorption spectroscopy. Um, so this is a, an X-ray cell, which looks quite nice and well designed here. And then in the schematic, and of course, at the beam line, it looks like this Heath Robinson affair. But in, in this setup, we've got an electrochemical window, which is, which is gold, a gold electrode, a very thin gold electrode, because we want our X-ray scopes to come in and out. Um, and then a three electrode normal cell. And we drive this oxygen reduction reaction here and deposit things onto this surface. And what you see is actually not very exciting for a set of extra absorption spectra because nothing changes. It deposits, it goes from zero. There's nothing on the surface, right? I get no signal. And then as I deposit, I see these zinc oxide spectra. And they don't change at all over time, right? So I'm depositing zinc oxide and it's staying as zinc oxide. But that's really then important because what that means is I don't need to take full spectra. I can sit at one place and just count and know that I've got much better time resolution and I'm only forming zinc oxide. So this is what you then get if you do that. You get really accurate species-specific deposition rate versus time as you check play with whatever parameter you want to do. Um, and this approach, actually, we've applied for measuring dissolution as well. And when you do, when you do experiments like this, if you design it properly, you can be super sensitive to a monolayer of dissolution from your surface into your sample. Um, and what we found throughout of this was this two-stage growth phenomena, rapid nucleation and then a slower growth. And it's this second phase growth, actually, that controls what you get. So we can do imaging at different points. Um, and this here is where we turned off the potential. So we stopped generating hydroxide you get a diffusion away of that and a reversion back to bulk kinetics. And you can see at pH 2, it just re-dissolves. But at pHs 4 and 5, actually, you start to get these really interesting structures. So it deposits as these individual rods. And the reason it's doing that is because this top surface here, the 0002 surface in zinc oxide, is extremely polar. Right? So if you think about the zinc oxide structure, it goes zinc ions, oxygen ions, zinc ions, oxygen ions. So any slice across that crystal structure has got a really high surface energy because it's all charged. So it doesn't like that surface, so it tries to minimize it, right? So if that surface is, that's why we get small top surface and long wires, right? It's minimizing that polar surface. If you put chloride in, it will stabilize that, right? It will screen the charge. But what happens when it re-dissolves is it doesn't just dissolve layer by layer by layer. It dissolves like a screw dislocation down into that. And that's because these edges are actually more stable. Right? So the edge is stable and the top is really active. And so you're able to get these beautiful um, hollow tubes. And that's related to, I guess we saw this morning, the two different crystal faces in acetate are dissolving at different rates. Right? The two crystal faces with two different energies are going to dissolve differentially. And, and, hit. and this is a really extreme version of that because we've got the added polarity for zinc oxide. We wanted to see whether we could see, see this, right? because I've just shown you some deposition kinetics, and then I took it out and put it in the SCM, which I told you we shouldn't really be doing, right? because actually you know, I might have changed it. And so we developed this approach um, of, over many beamline attempts. Um, to do transmission X-ray microscopy. So we've got an electrochemical cell here. It's got a bulk electrolyte at the top and flow at the bottom. And then this little narrow window, it's about one and a half millimeters, because I want my X-rays to be able to get all the way through now. So this is a big constraint on the system. 
but I can have liquid flowing through and normal electrochemistry. And then the detector. And so what we're going to do here is just start with nothing in the system or no, no bulk materials. We're going to image at the zinc edge. Okay, hopefully this will play. Whilst we're carrying out oxygen reduction on the surface. So this is the oxygen reduction current. You'll see nothing here. It's really not very interesting because we're not picking anything up. And then slowly you start to see contrast in the system. And remember, my electrodes are going right the way through my electrolyte. And what you're seeing there is supersaturation and nucleation in the solution of these colloidal nanoparticles. And they slowly then deposit on the surface and they'll grow as we go. So there was some question about whether there's a solution formation and then a precipitation or whether things nucleate on the surface directly and grow out. So this shows really clearly there's a solution supersaturation. One, we can measure it, which is pretty cool. But two, it separates out those two mechanisms. The solution drives it and then it precipitates. And then the growth is dependent on the rest of your conditions. Um, so eventually we ended up with quite a large design map, actually, um, based on understanding growth and time and conditions where we're able to say, OK, for this project here, which was a project where we were looking at creating active electrodes for using a solar cell, I can make perfectly interdigitated one dimensional systems and they lock into the polymer system that we were looking at in this paper. And they're all orientated in this direction, which is fast transport direction. So I've created a way that I can absolutely control what I get in my deposit or I want a really dense film. And this is about 100 nanometers thick. Um, this is an electrode. Elect this is actually a device here. So glass ITOs, zinc oxide and then P3HT um, organic solar cell. And this is a, an electron extracting device. And basically you go from these quite dramatically different conditions from having a coalesced system to having an individual system. And we're able to use that dramatically. Of course, it would be really nice if you could go to a pipeline and say, I would quite like this exact form of sideride at this exact level of orientation on the system, which um, I know some people think is possible. We are doing extraordinary control of the electrochemical interface here to absolutely define what you have when. Um, but it's a, an interesting idea. OK, I'm going to talk a little bit about nanoporous materials, mostly because they're so beautiful. Um, and mostly because I learned a lot about dialing again while I was here, and then we started to work on it much later. Um, dialing is this, um, well, here's a classic remaining shell of a cast iron cannonball, which has lost probably most of its iron and is, is just a graphitic shell left behind. Um, this is some beautiful dialoid um, silver gold, giving us this really characteristic um, nanoporous network of gold. And it's categorized by these critical parameters, an alloy composition, which is a percolation type threshold, and a critical potential, which is electrolyte dependent. Um, when, I'm, when I'm doing this lecture at Imperial, I normally work out my percolation threshold by making all the girls in the room stand up. But, um, but actually, we're not percolating today, so anyway. Um, so, so this percolation model basically says if I've got a less active element that wants to dissolve, so in that case it's silver and a silver gold alloy, there has to be a pathway right for the silver to get out. And if there's not a path for the silver to get out, then it will passivate with pure gold across the surface and you'll just get a bulk surface. If you've got enough silver, they all connect and you can create these, um, these porous networks. You also need a little bit of movement from the other elements. So in the gold silver case, the gold diffuses and allows this process to happen. So it's this competition between dissolution tendency and surface diffusion that enables you to get the dialing um, threshold. And there's lots of work done by other groups, and in, particularly with Monte Carlo simulation, that, that predict some of these behaviors. Um, a lot of work that was started here and then well, right here and then uh, previously, I guess, at Brookhaven, Newman and Saransky, trying to understand particular types of stress corrosion cracking where you would have brittle failure in materials that were supposed to be ductile. And so they developed this model, the film induced cleavage model that says, actually, you've got a ductile material, but you've got a brittle surface layer. And that surface layer is caused by these electrochemical processes that form these nanoporous structures on the surface. Um, and so, so this is an old, an old micrograph of Carl Saratsky's that shows the, the grain, the, I guess, the morphology and then the coarsening of that grain. Um, 
Nanoporous gold, when you do it this way, um, you can make a small layer and it coarsens quite easily, even at room temperature, because the surface diffusion of gold is quite high, even at room temperature. Um, and you can play with the surface diffusion and get it to speed up and slow down, depending on what you add in the, in the system. So what, I guess what we were interested in my group was understanding, well, why are these nanoporous materials brittle in the first place? Right, you can tell me I've now got a nanoporous layer and it's brittle. So that's not, that's just left me with a different question. Um, and to try and understand how that, there's mechanical or that the strain properties of that material changes as you change the pore size. Um, so if you want to understand strain and morphology or and size, um, then X-ray scattering is the technique you should use. And we use these two techniques. So I've called it specular X-ray diffraction here. That's your normal X-ray diffraction mode and some small angle scattering. And this will give you your lattice parameter, which of course is strain sensitive. And this will give you the size or the ligament spacing size in the material. And I'm slightly paranoid now that Tony's here because he's the absolute sex expert. So no, luckily there are no questions. Um, how to make nanoporous gold? It's the easiest thing, right? You can all go at home and make some nanoporous gold. You take some silver gold leaf that you might use for baking. Um, we buy ours from Jackson's Art Supplies, but other art supplies are also available. Gold leaf is about 100 nanometers thick. It's 12 carat. That means it's 65% silver. And um, that's above the percolation limit. And actually, because these are made for eating, they're pretty pure, right? You're not, they're not allowed to have toxic stuff in things that you can put on cakes. So it's actually a really nice supply of a silver gold alloy that works. Um, and you can, there, I did say there was a critical potential for de-alloying. But if you've got a strong enough acid, the open circuit potential is above that critical potential. So you can just float this stuff on a beaker of, I'm making this sound not very impressive, but on a beaker of nitric acid, and you will end up with nanoporous gold. Um, so, so we use some of this approach, um, coupled with some, so really easy chemical approach, coupled with a really complex advanced synchrotron approach to study some of these, these properties. So this is the kind of structure that you get just from doing SEM imaging afterwards, and you can see the longer you leave your foil in the acid, you get this coarsening behavior. But what we also saw, if you just do simple diffraction, and those of you with good eyes will see that when you start and when you finish, you've got this beautiful symmetric peak, but in the middle where you've got this intermediate pore size, there's an asymmetry in that diffraction, and that means we're actually getting a split in the, in the material that's got two regions that have got different strain. Um, and this is not just the composition is changing, right? It doesn't map what you would predict if it was just compositional change. So we did this in situ. Um, so here's the cell we made. Again, it's a transmission cell. We've got liquid pumping. We've got x-rays coming in and a 2D diffraction detector. Um, and this is the, what you see. So we're just sitting on one of the diffraction peaks over time in different concentrations of acid. And again, this is nitric acid. So we're not just changing the pH, we're changing the oxidizing potential. Um, um, so this one goes much faster. Right? In nine minutes, it's pretty much de -alloyed. I've got a shift in the diffraction peak and then a slow relaxation, right? So if I show you the extracted parameters from that, what you see, so this is the lattice parameter now that we extract from those diffraction data. And what you see is, this is where we started, this is where we finished, some relaxed state, but there's a huge strain that builds up in the material as we form these nanoporous structures. And it's a huge percentage strain um, comparatively to, to the material. Um, you get a different measure if you do this in situ or ex situ, actually. So it's really important that you are careful about how you're doing these measurements. And that's partly to do with adsorption and dehydration as you pull a nanoporous material out of the solution. In fact, you can see, and there's some beautiful videos online um, by Gleiter, that if you pull, as you take one of these, um, so these foils out of solution, they visibly flex right, as the charge exchange and get causes this stress in the surface. And of course, if you're really unlucky, they just fall to pieces because they're very brittle, because they're in this extraordinarily highly strained state at small grain size. Um, so to correlate that directly to the particle or the porosity, we did some sex, um, some SACS data. And again, you see these self-similar repeating trends across the different size. Um, we see fractal-like surfaces um, and a shift in that position that tells you it's coarsening. All right, so then we can put those things together and correlating the time. And you see actually, 
this middle graph, the amount of silver left, we've, we've done that two ways, both from ICP of the solution and some in-situ X-ray experiments. You see the, the silver starts to dissolve and then it goes to zero, near zero, never goes to exactly zero because there's always the odd silver atom that's just trapped right in a cluster of gold. But as the silver is almost all gone, that's when you see the ligament spacing, this huge rapid coarsening kinetics, and that's when you see that you've reached your maximum strain. So these three parameters are all coupled in the system. So we see a characteristic lens cell, it's self-similar coarsening, they all do the same thing, regardless of what concentration we're sat at, the time scale might be different, but it's self-similar, and it's driven by the surface diffusion. So I'm not going to talk too long about the system work that's mostly been done by Jonah Obacker at um, Johns Hopkins, and this is one of Jonah's um, materials that he sent us. That gold coarsening is very rapid, and if you wanted to use gold in that way, you'd probably want to stabilize it. And what they realized is that, of course, it's all driven by surface diffusion, and platinum has got really rubbish surface diffusion, right? It's very slow. And actually, if you put a little bit of platinum into this alloy, and this is about 5%, it pins the structure, right? So you can leave it for a long time and it doesn't coarsen. And, um, and so what we did was, you know, you have to leave it for a long time. So this is some TEM imaging of one of those structures. And you can see, you can see it's crystalline. So you can see some lattice imaging. You can see it's the porosity length scale of this is about five nanometers. But uh, that's showing up really badly. But this is the strain that we extract from the diffraction. And you can see it's enormous. And it doesn't really ever relax back down to normal. So these materials, stay very highly strained over time. The strain is pinned to the curvature, right? So if you maintain the morphology, you maintain the strain in these systems. Okay, so why is that interesting? Apart from understanding the mechanical properties of the nanoparticles, well, strain in surfaces does more than control the mechanical properties, right? Especially when you're in a metallic surface. If you think about having a strained interface, you've changed the local chemical potential, you change potentially the electronic contribution, you will change the plasmonic response. And so functionally, you are also changing lots of really useful properties about these materials by controlling the pore size because that controls the strain. Right? And these things are all connected. All right? So often when people talk about nanoporous materials, they only think about surface area or the size that you could use for a filter. But actually, you're changing a lot more fundamental stuff when you do that. And so there's a couple of examples where we've, we've used this as a useful entity, and the first one is just using dialloid gold as a broadband plasmonic material, and so it's got this really interesting. God, these slides are terrible. Sorry, this, I, I'm going to have to go over this for you. This is the, the, the optical response of dialloid gold. So normally, if you see a plasmonic response, so you took a beautiful gold nanoparticle, and everyone's seen kind of ruby red gold, you get a very sharp plasmonic peak because it's got a very well defined size and surface plasmon. So with these materials, you've seen that there's a huge range of curvatures, right? And so we get this really broad band response. And that's actually really useful because what that means is if I want to couple to that plasmon peak, I've got a very wide window of wavelength that I can do that with. And so what we've done here is coupled. These are up-conversion nanoparticles, and, and we use those in um, solar devices to convert solar radiation that's coming in at the infrared region down to a, an energy where we can then use in a sensitized device, right? So it allows us to basically shift the wavelength of incoming radiation to use it more effectively. Um, and when you couple this optically active material to something that's got an active plasmon, you can get enhancement of the electromagnetic field very locally. And we find actually it's super dependent on the pore size of our substrate. And there's an optimum pore size, which is you dial it for eight days, and we, we can speed that up, right? We know how to do it faster. But this gives us a 40%, a 40, not a 40%, a 40 times increase in the photoluminescence intensity of this nanoparticle simply by putting them on top of a nanoporous gold substrate. Okay. The other thing you can do is think about um, catalysis. So this is nanoporous platinum. This is actually a material we made from copper platinum, um, where the copper is now ripped out. And you see it's effective for methanol oxidation. We can see the effective particle size, or the effective surface area we get is something like 50 meters squared per gram of material. So it's comparable to a nanoparticle catalyst, but we haven't got any loose nanoparticle track. We've got a foil, right? And in that foil, we see there's no transport limitation in the methanol oxidation. So it's a potential alternative to using nanoparticles, and there are many reasons why you might not want to use nanoparticles, 
not least because of um, what I'm going to talk about next. So the last thing I want to mention, I think I've still got time. Um, we've done quite a lot of work on the toxicity of engineered nanomaterials. Um, so air pollution is um, largely, but not all, to do with CO2 emissions. There's an awful lot of tar particulates, chemical pollution. And then there's loads of stuff that we're just putting into the environment. If anybody that's using silver as, a, as an anti-odor tool in a spray, you're basically spraying nanoparticles. I'm not sure that's the wisest course of action we should be taking, just putting nanoparticles randomly into consumer products. But you can all buy them. And so in my group, we've been working quite a lot with some environmental scientists and medics who are interested in, in lung chemistry to understand how do engineered nanomaterials interact with cells? And you're asking yourself, what has that got to do with corrosion? We're all scared of toxicity. So what that has to do with corrosion is that the primary response, the primary toxic response for a nanoparticle with a cell is whether or not it dissolves. Right? This is the main determinant of toxicity. Um, there are other factors, like, you know, what size was it? Could it get into the cell? What shape is it? Does the shape damage the cell membranes? But the main thing that determines the toxicity is the dissolution propensity of that particle. OK. And it turns out that that's quite complicated. Well, you all know that, but different materials will behave differently. But there's, there's quite a lot of, I guess, lack of knowledge about how chemistry of particles, and in particular, the solubility of different materials will impact the long-term behavior of nanoparticles. And so these are the most common nanoparticles by bulk volume that are currently being used. And if I asked you how any of those particles were going to dissolve, you could probably all tell me this. All right, so TiO2 is not going to do very much in terms of dissolution, and it turns out it's not very toxic. Carbon nanotubes don't really dissolve, but you can get oxidative damage of the, the framework, and that can, can cause some, some damage. Silver, that dissolves oxidatively. Ceria, that dissolves reductively, right? The cerium-3 is more soluble than the cerium-4. Zinc oxide, that doesn't need any electrochemistry. That's just a chemical transformation. All right, so now this is why this is important, because the inflammatory response, if you are to inhale, say, some nanoparticles, and you get a response to that, your body does two things. It generates reactive oxygen species, right? So this is, a, this is a biological response to try and get rid of foreign objects. But of course, generating reactive oxygen species means locally you've raised the oxidation potential, right? The EH locally has gone up and it acidifies locally. So the inflammatory response is doing everything that electrochemistry would do to try to dissolve something, right? But each of these particles is going to dissolve, respond differently to that biological response. Right? The silver will go, well, I'm being oxidized and I'm acid, so I might go a bit faster. But the ceria is actually stabilized by that high potential. So there isn't a one size fits all. Can we, what we're trying to do in my group is predict, at least minimize the toxic response and recognizing that different particles respond differently. And there will be a feedback loop. Right. So if you've got an inflammatory response that causes further dissolution, say acidification dissolving the zinc, then you set up this biological cascade that increases the inflammatory response that will then make the particle dissolve faster. So we, are, we have to remember there's a feedback loop. And then the next thing is, well, if you could do all of that, which would be nice, just here's your safety envelope for nanoparticles, but also how do we use some of these processes? So these are some data on um, silver nanoparticles, and there's a, couple of, there's a couple of pieces here. So this is silver nanoparticles, and they're exposed to lung surfactant. And your lung is really kept moving by the surfactant in there, which has four main proteins in the lung. And this is just a test tube test, but we've also done this with um, animal studies. And you see when the nanoparticles hit the lung or hit the surfactant, they form this corona that you can see here. So this is the surfactant. But they also sequester very specific proteins. So there's differential absorption onto these particles of those different proteins. Which you, might, which you might well expect. And for most of us, that's fine because we're relatively healthy. But if you've got any kind of compromised lung state, um, then actually disrupting the protein in your lung surfactant can cause all kinds of um, mechanical damage to the lung tissue and how well you're able to breathe. Um, this is a, an electron tomography um, image of, this is a silver nanoparticle. It's actually inside 
a long epithelial cell. So this was from a tissue culture. We've blanked out so you can just see the particle. And what you can see is this very dense core. Let me show you. Um, and then this diffuse layer of stuff around the outside. And that's the nanoparticle dissolving, so it's releasing some silver ions. But it doesn't get very far because it reacts very rapidly with any spare sulfur that's around. All right. Sulfur is everywhere. You said CO2, Bill. For me, it's sulfur. Everywhere I go, I find sulfides doing something. Um, and silver sulfide, it turns out the solubility product of silver sulfide is 10 to the minus 52. Right? So it just doesn't want to go anywhere. Silver meets sulfide, it's dropping out. Right? What this does when we do this experiment in um, animal studies, it causes a cascade of enzyme upregulation because you take sulfur out of a system and then you get this response where the body creates more H2S locally. OK, but the good news is this trapping of the silver ions by the sulfur is somewhat of a detoxifying mechanism right? because it's the free ions that normally cause the toxicity. So the acute response to silver is really low from a toxic response. Right? We don't yet know what the long term effect of having lots of silver sulfide is, but the acute response to silver is, is, is low. Um, so then we were and we've been doing this quite a lot. What, what do these properties do in the lung? To we know, you know, everybody knows silver is beautifully antimicrobial, right? The Romans knew that. We should certainly know it. Um, and you'll see that's that's the reason silver is putting lots of these consumer products because it's antibacterial, antimicrobial. Um, and in particular, we're interested in in diseases of the lung, um, and we've been working on on tuberculosis. And so I've just told you that silver is not very toxic. But as a great man once said, even before Faraday, um, it's the dose that makes the poison, right? And different cells in your body are, and different organisms have got a different dose response to each other. So something that is safe for your lung epithelial cell, it turns out that same dose is toxic to a TB bacteria. Okay. So there's a window where you can take silver nanoparticles um, and try, we're still we're in the middle of this process, to um, locally attack the, the TB bacteria. So just for a little bit of context, if you've got TB, this is the cocktail of drug you have to take every day. There's, and, and one of the reasons for that is that TB hides inside the macrophage cell, so it's disguised in your, in your immune system. So you need to create a particle that that same macrophage cell will want to swallow, right? So you, we hide these nanoparticles inside this bigger multi-metallic particle, which is a, a PLGA matrix. Um, and just briefly, what we find here um, is the nanoparticles, once they're taken up and inside these particles, they release both silver and zinc ions. They permeabilize, permeabilize the membrane of the bacteria. So one of the main mechanisms, they make the outer membrane um, porous, which either directly kills it or makes it much more susceptible to conventional drugs. So drugs that um, typically are very ineffective suddenly become effective when you combine them with this. But at this dose level, there's no effect on the structural lung cells because we've done all of those preliminary works to understand the, to the toxicity. And you can see here this huge drop in viability of the TB um, when you add nanoparticles. OK. The last thing I want to do is just go back to zinc oxide. So I talked about going from bulk to surface and precipitating out all those beautiful um, zinc oxide nanostructures. Of course, the corollary of that is if you go backwards, you'll dissolve your zinc oxide. I told you that a little bit with the formation of the tubes. But actually, this pH window here where zinc oxide does this is biologically really relevant. So your extracellular pH is on the is kind of neutral. So in your blood plasma, for example, it's about six to seven. Inside a cell, inside a lysosome, it's around about five. And that drops you over this barrier. So that means two things. It means zinc, which is you know, it's an essential element. It's not really very toxic for humans, but if you get enough of it locally, it, it's damaging. And so this is a, a human macrophage cell that's been, I want to say fed. I don't think fed is quite the right word. We've, we've cultured it with some zinc oxide nanowires. And you can see this. You can see this is not a happy cell. In fact, it's a dead cell. Right? Lots of um, flagellate at the surface and, and damage internally. And what you see here, this is, this is some data extracted from confocal microscopy from the live cell imaging. And the green signal here is that it's a fluorescent dye for the zinc 2 plus ion. So this signal only goes up if dissolution is happening. And the red 
single here. That's a dye that stains the nucleus of the cell. So you see red if the cell is dead, and you see green as the zinc dissolves. And you only ever see red after you see this increase in the green, right? So the death is correlated to the to, to the to, to the dissolution. Um, so this is a human macrophage cell, and we know that the death rate of that, that we see all kinds of damage in situ. And then taking this knowledge, we then applied that to looking at some breast cancer cells. So what you see here, these are some breast cancer cells on a plate. What we're going to do is expose them to zinc oxide nanoparticles whilst we're imaging them. And again, we've got these same two dyes. So if you see it go green, that means the particle has dissolved right, and released zinc ions. And if you see it go red, it means the cell is dead. All right. And you can see it only dissolves inside the cells, right? And very quickly it kills them. So there's a, a couple of things you see from this. One, it's actually really effective at delivering locally a very high dose, right? Because the particles carry the zinc inside and then dissolve. You'll see that some of these cells are extraordinarily resistant, right? And this is a big challenge with, with breast cancer, in particular that you've got this heterogeneity of resistance in the system. Um, and they can take different levels of dose to do that. Eventually, they will all die in this scenario, but it's a big challenge to work out the dose response in such a heterogeneous system. Um, but this is work that's still ongoing, um, uh, looking towards this. In this particular example, we only had breast cancer cells in here, right? So we didn't have to differentiate where the zinc went. So the next challenge in, in some of the work that BASMA is doing is targeting it, right? So you put a specific biomarker on the zinc oxide, so it only targets specific cells. But it's pretty effective and it's local, right? It's not systemic. And because, Howard, shut me off too early. I got fed up. I got fed up. Did you press the black button? I don't, oh, I might have pressed the black button. Nobody told me not to press the black button. I didn't do it on purpose. But it's somewhat camouflaged, it's somewhat camouflaged on, the, on the thing. I'm, on, I'm almost on my conclusion slide anyway. Um, I have been that, <laughs> <laughs> and you should be on the one that says summary. Oh, summary. Okay. <laughs> well, all right, I'm going to flip through that one. Okay. So I guess one thing I wanted you to, well, a few things I guess I'd like you to take away from this is that nanoscale phenomena are important and, and often dominate corrosion processes. We see that in passivity. We see it in pitting, we see it in de-alloying. Um, and, but the mechanistic understanding at this length scale is still lacking, which is great because that means there's a huge opportunity to still keep doing work in this area. You do need operando tools to do this because lots of these systems are so sensitive to the field and the temperature and the concentration gradients that if you're not doing operando, you, you're really not entirely sure that you've caught the system. But pick the right technique to answer the question, right? So you'll saw today, I do know we did spectroscopy, we did diffraction, we did imaging. We thought about what was the question and then picked the technique, not the other way around. Um, and corrosion is a problem across all sectors. I've shown you work from catalysis, from, from plasmonics, from biology. And the big challenge is that all those communities use different languages. But they all need corrosion, right? So I guess that learning to speak different languages is really important. And I guess not be afraid of learning to speak new languages. Um, and I would just like to revisit this definition. So this bit I'm not going to argue with you back about. Um, but I'm going to say often corrosion results in effects that are beneficial to the usage of the material considered. And with that, I would just thank the people who did all the work. So in red here are the important people that actually did all of those hard experiments. Um, not that these guys aren't important, but they did the hands-on doing of those experiments. And these are the collaborators that I've had on these projects that I've shown today. Um, so colleagues at Imperial, at Brookhaven, I guess Alison was at in Brookhaven when we did that work together. You'll notice there's a whole bunch of beamlines, um, Brookhaven, Diamond, Spanford, Australia, synchrotrons that enable us to do that work. Roger, Carl and Jonah, um, Nick Laycock, Alan Turnbull, Stefan Schwander's a, a TB guy. Jasmine works on breast cancer and, and Sean and Dave Williams. Um, and a whole bunch of generous funding agencies that have let us do all this really fun work. And finally, you for listening and again, the Institute for this very um, humbling award. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. Very, very good. As I say, there are, I'll just come around here. There are no official questions to Mary, but I'm sure if you catch Mary later, she will answer you some unofficial answers. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's just one thing to point out, actually, that, that many of the people that Mary mentioned have also won the Your Evans Award. So she is a long train of people, mm -hmm. about fourth or fifth down the list. Um, and hopefully some of your researchers hopefully they will, will win in due course. I have to say, I also, I, I think I said this to you earlier, I'm the only person that's given this lecture twice because a few years ago I gave Hugh, Hugh Isaac's award lecture because he, he, unfortunately he died before he was actually able to pick it up. That was much, much harder talk to do. This, this one was a pleasure. Good. Okay, thank thanks you. again, Mary. Thank Take you. Care. Okay, thank you. That's the end of the conference for today. Not, not the